those of those of us that are going to speak here today, um, we meet every Monday since the middle of last December to talk about all the issues of canine in the United States. And there is the amazing thing is for me is what I did not know was happening and was we could we found from different people. Uh, about how people are using the use of force or how they're uh, uh, making adjustments to their policies and making it harder for the people to work, uh, the canine people to work. So it's kind of interesting uh, and the different things. So we get a praise of that every week. We got guys coming in uh, talking about things they heard here and there. And, and, and of course, um, one of our partners is Scott Sargent, who's not going to be here today because he's in He's enjoying a work session in some mountaintop in the Alps or something. I forget. He showed me a picture, showed us a picture. But yeah. he was a uh, quite a uh, quite an inter interesting person. His job is uh, now he was a commander of the L.A. Use of Force Division for years. And now he works for as an attorney. He's now an attorney and he works for the DOJ uh, looking at some of the consent decrees and this is where we got our information about what happens when a canine program starts to go bad. Where is it? Where do they usually point? And then we got Lou, who's a retired chief, um, teaching classes in Mount Police. Um, long, he's been everything in the police department. John Kerwick's a mid manager. I don't know what would you call yourself. You were the captain. A lot of people would call me a lot of different things, Don. Well, you're, I talked to your lieutenant the other night, and he said you are responsible for everything good happening in NYPD MTA. So uh, the That's largest, he, he went and told me about some of the things you just allude to, and that is you have the largest mobile bomb squad of just about anybody in the U.S., correct? Well, no, I, I only dealt with the canine section of that, Don. I wasn't a bomb tech. I mean, I meant the canine section. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And then we have Gene Ramirez, who has been a, an attorney for us for so long that I I think it was the 90s. And um, when he was when he was younger and and used to have a little more fun at the table discussing strategy and things like that, it was kind of an interesting time for me uh, who provides us with all of the updates legally as they come out, as they're put out, anything that looks like it might be good for canine or police that in general, he sends to us and we try to get it up on the newsletter for everybody here that that may get them or does, does not know how they start. Um, Steve White, our featured speaker today, is, um, is, for those of you that were here before, I've, I've known Steve forever. Uh, but I've lost track of them over the years. But I started out with the Washington State group teaching at USPCA way back in the day. And uh, and Steve is a re just recently retired sergeant trainer from the Seattle Police Department. And he is a wealth of knowledge as all of our, uh, we call ourselves the canine group. Um, uh, it's, it's fascinating that to Malachi's point, Sometimes, I don't know how many times we've said in our little Monday meetings, we should be taping this and putting this out because it, it, it's so much good information and so much good dis, uh, discussion on different things. But Steve, if you're ready to go, I think we'll get going if that's okay with you. I appreciate the introduction and kind of the background that you gave about uh, the working group that, that gets together on Mondays to get these presentations going. Um, and it came because we were just concerned with the direction that uh, police canine, uh, not so much was going, but the way it was being perceived and um, some things that we could do to proactively um, get ahead of some of the issues that are coming up for us. And that's what this presentation is about. If you see the title of about canine searches, command and control from the ground up, um, this really is a ground up activity, but you have to have the upper echelons involved in this and understanding what's going on. Uh, that upper echelon work is gonna be covered in a follow-up presentation uh, to be given next month by John Kerwick, Scott Sargent, and Lou Furland. Um, but today I'm gonna to talk about the nuts and bolts of uh, canine searches and how it plays out. So 
as we get going with this, um, I want you to give you kind of a roadmap of where we're going to go through the presentation today. First off, we got to realize that um, we're going to borrow from ICS. We're going to go ahead and use some concepts that every police officer in the country should be trained on because that's one of the standards the federal government has put on us. Uh, the incident command system, um, we all think it's a big thing that we had to go and we had to get our uh, ISO 700s or whatever it is the, for qualification on it. But the reality is it's actually uh, borrowed from how we actually do our work anyway. But the beauty of it is the strength of its structure. And so we're going to borrow from that. I'm going to talk about roles and who does what during the search and and why having those roles in a division of labor is critical for a can handler because you've only got one job. There's only one thing you're supposed to do. And if you can focus on that one job, everything goes better. And de-escalation is all the rage right now. And it has uh, come to the forefront over the past two years in particular after the George Floyd protests and things like that. Uh, but um, it's been on the radar screen for years before that and it is working its way uh, into general law enforcement. And yes, you can actually de-escalate in Canada deployments, and we'll talk about the, the exact way you go about it. Um, and when you do that, everything moves more smoothly. And if you can figure out how to get everybody working within their roles and um, being prepared to de-escalate when the time comes, you can come up with the, the kind of solution you want because we all know that, you know, the safest arrest you can make is one where you generate compliance. So our goal at the outset should always be to generate compliance. Um, no matter how long you search, no matter where you go, if you can generate uh, someone walking out and giving up, life gets better for everybody. Everybody gets home safe and sound. And that's what we're looking for. If you have to use force and you know that you've done what you could to try and generate compliance, you're going to be viewed much more favorably by the courts and by the courts of public opinion. So without any further ado, let's kind of dive into the content. Here we go. So why we're talking about ICS. The incident command system has been developed as a universal framework for uh, handling major events. Well, it works pretty well for small events because you can still use some of the defined and designated roles that you have in ICS. And it's pretty simple. And we'll, we'll talk some more about those roles and who does what, but if everybody stays in their lane, things go smoothly. Just like when you're going down the highway, it gets a little dicey when people start wandering out of their lane. We don't want that. But if everybody can stay in their lane and follow their role, everything goes much better. And once you get through this and you realize that there is an incident commander at, at a scene, and there is uh, there are special resources that have special tasks that are used there, and that there are support resources that do other things, involved in a canine search. Once you get those three things figured out, the rest of it all falls in place. And one of the other things you have to realize too is you have a place to start. And um, it actually can be as simple as like uh, saying, that car right there is our command post, but there are some other things that go with that. Having some place where everybody knows that's the rally point, that's where we're gonna talk, then there's a safe access route to it, is incredibly valuable. And the beauty of ICS is that it's scalable. Yes, it's designed, and the way it's taught to us is like for major catastrophic events, but you can dial it down to what you need to get through a search smoothly if you try. So it's really important to think about the scalability of that system and how you're gonna use it. Because once you get this thing scaled down to what you need for the size of operation you're working on, because canine searches can be small or they can be big, once you get that, you find out that this structure is ideal for canine operations. You can, there isn't almost anything you can't do with it as long as you are principle driven. Don't try and follow a cookbook or a recipe, get a few principles under your belt and everything will go a lot better. So the next thing we have to talk about in the roles is the primary officer. Now the primary officer is the de facto incident commander. That person uh, that either is the primary officer that uh, got there first or was the senior officer when a group of officers arrived together should be the incident commander. And that person should establish the command post and say, this is where we're starting. This is how this is going to fan out from here. Um, their job is to go ahead and make sure the containment is established. Uh, if you're a containment officer, if, you, if you're a canine officer, you owe your success to containment. 
Containment officers are critical to this, and way too many police departments don't spend the time to teach containment to their officers, particularly containment for canine operations, because it's a little different than you're, when you're dealing with some static operations. Um, that primary officer should also um, identify resources that are needed and then request them. You know, they're the one that's going to say, we need a dog at this location. Now, if you're a good canine handler, if you're the kind of person that I would want working with me, we're going to listen to the radio. We're going to hear it. We're going to be headed that way anyway. We won't jump into the call until we're asked, but we will point ourselves in that direction. So we're ready to respond in a timely manner. But um, if in case they are on another frequency, they didn't hear it or whatever, that request has got to go out so that the canine team can get out there and do their job. And then once they get there, their job is to coordinate the event. Once uh, once that primary, that incident commander takes charge of that, that thing, they own it. They stay there. They can delegate that, delegate certain sub roles within the incident command structure, but they can't abdicate. Somebody else can come and take over of a higher rank or if needed, but whatever, there's got to be some way that the, the, the transfer of ownership of that call is clearly identified. Um, it's important that your incident commander is not the canine officer. And I know this is tough because canine officers tend to be uh, very focused and driven individuals who want to go out there and find that bad guy and they want to take the lead and take charge. But when you do that while you're trying to manage the resource of the dog, things can get out of hand. And really, the canine officer's role should just be to watch that dog and, and apply their dog the way they're trained. That primary officer takes, and takes charge of this. And I would tell a little story about why this works out so well. Um, the officer and dog depicted in this uh, were involved in a, uh, a, pretty, a, a, a violent domestic violence situation. Um, the suspect had um, uh, assaulted um, his spouse and uh, he was known to have firearms, but wasn't known whether he was armed or not. Um, a track was started from the scene and um, the track led uh, some blocks away to a residential construction site. The dog started to go into the residential construction site in through the open stud walls uh, of the structure. And the handler who was uh, had gone through a briefing with the covers off, cover officers who knew what was going on, had informed radio as they were proceeding what was uh, where they were headed. All of this was being handled. He had two cover officers with him. Those two cover officers that were running with him were on uh, either side of him. And as they rounded the corner, one of the cover officers saw that as the dog was going in, there was a suspect. He called out and says, I see him. The dog was stopped. The handler stopped the dog short of making contact with the suspect to try and challenge him out. Suspect dropped to his knees as ordered, put his hands over his head. And as he started to go up with his, with his one hand, the other hand went into his jacket. He pulled out a gun and he shot the dog. Uh, then the gun came up and it was pointed to the officers. They returned fire. Suspect was shot at the scene, died. Uh, officers all survived. Dog survived. Um, saw that, that dog was a knucklehead, literally, and the bullet hit him at the top of the head, skittered along the outside of his skull and out through the back, and he was okay and went back to finish out his career. And the reason I, I want to tell you this story is this case right here would have been very different had I been doing it back in the days when I was a county deputy. There were plenty of times that I would run a track and I would lose my cover officers. I was stupid. I was young. I was eager. And I was I was faster than I, I've never been accused of being really fast, but um, I was fast enough that I would lose cover officers going through the pucker brush out in the county where I was working. And I would have encountered that person by myself. But these officers had learned from mistakes from the past and knew that they had to stay together as a team when looking for this guy. And it was because they were together as a team, they were able to engage him, offer him the opportunity to surrender. The guy didn't want to take it. That's his choice. He initiated fire and he brought that gun up on those officers and he paid a price for it. The point of bringing this up to you is that's a very different outcome that I would have had in my young and dumb days. And I think we've come farther as an industry to understand the importance of contact and cover and making sure that we proceed with uh, unified tactics. And as a result, these officers came out of this and this was, 
this event happened in the early 2000s and uh, we've come farther since then. So it's really important that we think about how we're doing these things. Even if you look at this, these officers did everything right. They tried, they, you know, they, they, they had established their, their tactical plan before they proceeded. They kept everybody informed where they're going. They challenged that suspect, the gunfight ensued and they came out of it okay. Um, and ideally the perfect outcome would have been that guy would have given up, but he didn't make that choice. But because they had their act together, they came out of it in good shape. And that's what we want to talk about. Now this case was made possible because they had containment. This guy ran into that house to hide because he saw he couldn't get any farther than where he wanted to go because containment officers had established um, that uh, a boundary that kept him from going by. And containment's really important when it comes to canine cases. I think it's fair to say that, uh, particularly in agencies that do tracking or agencies that do uh, area searches and building searches, that uh, most of your, arisa, your arrests with the dog result from containment. And if the, dog, if the suspect isn't giving up to a containment officer, that suspect is probably going to go to ground because they don't want to run past containment. Sometimes they do, but a lot of times there's a lot of psychological pressure on them to go to ground. And when they go to ground and they're stationary, guess what? They become a, a scent source that starts to billow out from that point and actually makes it easier for your dog to find them. So one of the ways you put this psychological pressure on these people is to keep your emergency lights on. You know, I, I actually will uh, occasionally take my PA and I'll turn the to external radio and I'll let the radio sound blare out over the PA because even if they can't see the lights, they hear that and they wonder what's going on. And if different officers at different times are doing this around containment, they never know where everybody is. But it's really critical that you stay in one spot, remain in your car, and you get yourself set up in a way that um, you see the maximum. And when I talk about diagonally opposite corners here, what I mean is if you get there and you have a crime scene and you're obviously going to have the primary officer and his or her cover officers respond to that, but the containment officers, when they're available, should respond to diagonally opposite corners. So if you have one, one, one officer here, diagonally opposite of where the scene is, that officer can see along two axes. The next officer coming in should go to the diagonally opposite corner from that. And that way they have a box built around it. And it's better that you start wide and then tighten up than try to get in close to the scene because most of the time suspects are well past where we set up our containment because of the delay it takes in someone making the call to 911, 911 centers, processing it, getting officers en route. And um, you, it's amazing. Um, even I can cover a city block in under a minute. So if you have a five minute delay, I can get five blocks away. So it's really important that you set this thing up first. So what do we do then? If we have resources available, then we bring them in the, in the next diagonally opposite corners. And that means putting someone up here inside that, that first perimeter and the next one after that. Now what you have are these overlapping perimeters where you can literally create a miniature grid where you can see where this person is. These people, if they stay stable, they get high ground, they get on corners, they can do that. Now, this is this depiction is an ideal representation. It's not the way it really works out because we live in a world that has curves and hills and valleys and, and you're gonna do the best you can. It's not perfect, but the more visible you are, the more audible you are, the more pressure you put on that person to stay, stay in one place. And we, we played with this back in the 1990s where we actually played essentially a, a game of capture the flag. We had a suspect start, a, a, a quarry officer uh, who's playing the role of a suspect, start at a location. And he had a pretty tough slog uh, up a hill, then uh, through an open space on an old uh, decommissioned military installation. And if we said, if you can get to this point without being detected, you win, we buy you dinner. If you, uh, if you can't get by, that's okay. You're not going to have to buy dinner, but we get good information for training our dogs. So they were motivated to get there. And what we found was that if these officers started breaking their discipline and they started moving, it was easier for those uh, officers simulating the suspect actions to get to that point 
and get their free dinner. So it's really important to exercise discipline and containment and to train your containment officers and to help them think about it and set this up in your head. On your way to the call, you should mentally log where these people are and set it up and get it rolling. Containment is one of those critical roles for canine searches that you gotta have and you gotta have it done well. Uh, now, you as the canine officer are gonna go through this process and you have to remember that once you get there, you only have one thing to do. Your one job uh, is to go ahead and deploy that dog as you're trained and focus on it. To do that, you're gonna to have to be briefed by the primary officer. You take a briefing with them. They have to give you the information that's gonna tell you the things that you need to know. Um, you have to make sure that this is an appropriate canine deployment, uh, because if it's not, if this isn't the kind of thing that you should be deploying your dog on, it's going to look bad for everybody. Uh, so uh, I know that different agencies and different communities have different standards about what they want, but the deployment rules that you have should be clearly spelled out in your policy. And if you're not, talk to your command and get that stuff really clearly defined. Once you understand whether it is or isn't an appropriate canine deployment, then you can go ahead and proceed. And remember, resist the urge to become the incident commander. Don't take over that role. Stick to your lane, let them stick to theirs. You also shouldn't be the leader of the search. Now, don't get me wrong. We know that if, for example, if you're tracking, your dog is gonna be out in front of you and you're gonna be pulling that team along the route to get to that person. That puts you in the position of point that is different than being the team leader. Don't confuse the two. The point is the person who goes up front, who's trying to read the lay of the land, or in this particular case, read the dog and the lay of the land to make sure that you're on the right track to getting where you need to be to find that person. The team leader's job is to make sure that everybody stays in their roles and does their job, that they're, that as we come into other environmental factors that need to be uh, taken into account, you make adjustments. Um, you know, Scott Sargent had a quote where he said, stepping out of the canine handler role can lead uh, to deviation from the search plan by, because you're juggling roles as the team leader, the arresting officer, the cover officer, and all those things. The odds are this will lead to reduced control of the dog. You don't want that. Maximum control of our dog is going to be what we need to have when we're deploying, looking for a suspect. And the more you divide your attention with other roles, the less focus you have on your dog, and your dog will pick up on that. They are very astute readers of their handler's behavior. And when they know that you're distracted by other things, oh, good, I'll handle the rest of this. You go handle all that other stuff that doesn't matter to me. I'm gonna go find this guy. And then we might run into problems. So it's very important, stay in your role. Um, and as you go through this process, uh, you know, you've know you got to support the other officers that are with you on this thing. And those cover officers are gonna run with you and they're gonna do a lot of important things. I strongly recommend that if you have enough officers with you, I realize I'm talking to an audience that may have, be like I was with a county deputy with me and one other deputy covering an entire county for a swing shift, or it may be agencies that have plenty, you know, municipal agencies with plenty of resources. If you have, the, have it available, one of those cover officers should be dedicated solely to you. Their job is to watch the environment where you and your dog are there, not to watch the dog, there to watch the environment around you, scanning for threats, scanning for opportunities, and taking advantage of that stuff. Um, there should be a team leader, one person that says that at least makes the call. Now, he or she, if you don't have enough officers to create a full team, that team leader could be one of the cover officers, whether it's you know left, left guard, right guard, or rear guard, it doesn't matter, but that team leader is the one everybody acknowledges is making the calls. Once you have those roles fully established, um, then you can go ahead and decide who else is going to form the arrest team. Because remember, we've got the only tool of police inventory that will drag us five blocks through the city from the local stop and rob to where that bad guy is hiding behind somebody's house underneath their back deck. You're going to need an arrest team there. You as a handler should not be part of that arrest team. Your job has, has ended at that point. You've gotten them to the suspect. Keep your dog there. Keep scanning the, the you know the the environment for threats or accomplices or anything else you need to deal with. But let the cover officers 
decide who among them is going to be the arrest team. If you have to go hands-on with a suspect while you're trying to control your dog, things can get pretty, pretty bad. I know that many of our certifications involve a search and a pat down, then you have to handle a suspect. But if you have cover officers there whose hands are otherwise occupied and don't have a dog to deal with, let them do that. That search exercise is really just a demonstration of control that's possible. It is not necessarily something you should do on a regular basis, especially if you have the resources available at the end of the search, which you truly need. Um, it's important to remember that as we go through this process, you're gonna go through this thing and these are pretty complex pieces. There are a lot of moving parts in this canine search. And the only way you're gonna be getting this all together and working properly is to have a proper pre-deployment pre briefing. That means the search team is assembled, the information that they need is gathered and disseminated among them. They all confirm that they know it. Everybody in that pre-deployment briefing should acknowledge, I understand this. And that means, doesn't mean just nod your head. It means maybe repeating it back, paraphrasing or something like that. All that active listening stuff that they tell you in there, plays a role in this and it's important. And we'll talk about it later, why that's why you gotta have that. And you also have to know exactly who's doing what, who's left guard, who's right guard, who's gonna be dedicated cover for the canine handler, who's gonna go ahead and be the rear guard or alternate responsibilities swinging and looking for rear guard as you proceed on this. Because we all know that our dogs can take us along a route where a suspect could double back to the downwind side and we won't know it that we've passed that person up and now they have our back. And we wanna make sure that we have somebody watching that back. And that's why having a rear guard, somebody's responsible for checking to the rear, making sure that we're not getting ambushed is a critical role. Doesn't matter if it's a building search, area search, a track, that is absolutely essential. Then the other thing you have to realize is this is gonna happen. And if you have engagement with a suspect then that dog is, uh, is encounters a suspect and that person begins to assault the dog, either because the dog's been sent in as a tool of force or he gets the drop on the dog, what do you do? Um, I think that it's probably safe to say that for all states, the dog uh, doesn't have the same right of protection that a human being would. We can use lethal force to protect a human being that's being assaulted, but dogs are not human beings and the courts don't recognize them as such and so uh, we run into trouble if we think that we can use deadly force to do this. So your pre-deployment briefing should always include uh, a reminder to those cover officers that if the dog is assaulted, we cannot use deadly force to defend the dog. We're gonna have to stand by and come up with something else. There are other less lethal tools available. There are other things we can do, but realize that's the, that's the legal situation that we face right now. And those officers need to know this going in because um, if they don't, they may get themselves in trouble for applying deadly force on a suspect of assaulting a dog. And we don't want that to happen. We want everybody to come out of this with their physical and professional health intact. And once you get these things there, you refine them until everybody concurs, everybody's in agreement, this is the tactical plan, this is the way we go. Tactical planning before you start is the way you keep yourself out of trouble. Remember, PPPP, proper planning prevents poor performance. And if we plan and we operate according to that plan, we have to realize that the plan is there as a framework. And there's a saying in the military that battle plans only survive first contact with the enemy. Well, police tactical plans only survive first contact with the suspect, and you're gonna have to adapt and adjust. But if you have a starting framework and you have defined rules, it's far easier to do that adjustment that everybody else all of a sudden decide, I'm gonna do this thing. And next thing you know, you have a gaggle of officers in a swarm on somebody and, it, and, and all of a sudden their tactics are out the window, left themselves vulnerable to, to an ambush from an accomplice on the outside, or maybe there's more being deployed on that person than they need. So really important, get it there, get it all uh, under, uh, you know, get concurrence and then document it. Now, when I'm talking about documenting, there's a lot of things to consider. The best way to document it is on body-worn video. If your agency doesn't have body-worn video, maybe you have in-car video, get it at least on audio from the in-car video. So in other words, do this within earshot of a microphone that you're issued by the department. If you don't have that, then fine. Document it on paper. That means you have to go in-depth explaining to people 
all right, what's the charge? If we find this person, you know, canine officer, you should ask that officer in charge, that prime officer, if I bring this person back to you, what are you going to charge them with? If you're coming into this thinking that it's going to be a felony domestic violence, the guy's, well, actually, no, it's just a misdemeanor. Okay, that may change it in your jurisdiction. Or if you're thinking you're going for a robbery, he says, well, actually, it was a shoplift and he just kind of brushed the clerk on the way out. Mm, no, not, now you have, you know, you have a theft with a minor assault. It's not really uh, a robbery, at least it, in, in our agency, it wouldn't be. You have to make sure that Canine warnings, they understand that they have to stop and give canine warnings and that the content of the canine warning has to be clear. It has to say who you are, that the dog is going to be deployed, that the dog can bite them if found, and you have to give them an opportunity to comply. And those four components have to be in every warning, who you are. This is the police with a police dog. The police dog finds you, the police dog will bite you. Come out now and uh, or uh, make your presence known to the nearest officer that those four components have to be in there and you got to make sure that you cover them <clears throat> document the start point where if it's a, particularly if it's a track where are we starting this track and how do we know that that track that start point is not so stale or contaminated to be beyond the dog's ability to follow then you also have to see where are we going in relation to uh, a building search are we entering from the point of entry that we where we found a broken door or broken window or do we have another way to get in that maybe is a little safer or better? Uh, we want a safe entry point. We also want a safe access route to our command post. So that stuff has to be and documented. Make sure your description of the suspect is in your documentation, whether it's in writing, on video, it doesn't matter. That description has to be sufficient that you can really say that when you find that person, that's what you're looking for, as best you have. Also, anything about the suspect behavior that, that should give officers concern. You know, was that was that person violent? Were they acting in a way that makes you think they might be in a, a bit of a, a mental health or emotional or substance abuse crisis? If so, that's going to change your deployment rules, and you're going to have to talk to your agency about how that goes. But that stuff should be in there. Any weapons? Any weapons that person is known to have, but they didn't. Uh, they don't know whether they have them with them or not. That person's history of using weapons. If you have that information, uh, access to Improvised weapons along the route should be uh, thought about too. You're gonna have to form this up. If you, for example, um, you're tracking along and you think this person's unarmed and you track past a woodshed and you find an ax sheath laying there but with no ax, somebody had better tell the rest of the team that. That's important information. You should also, document anything about hazards. If, for example, it's a building search and say, hey, this is a chemical factory, they have chemical spills on the ground. You may want to get booties for your dog at that point. You may decide the dog's not an appropriate tool to deploy there because they're really vulnerable to chemical toxicity on their pads. And it's really important that we, you know, make sure that we aren't operating our dogs um, and putting them at needless risk. Anything that's relevant, that should be documented. So if you Ideally, you get it on your body-worn video. Next best is going to be on IC uh, in-car video, the audio. And then the final thing is write it down. And by the way, if you have these things on body-worn or in-car video, you should probably write them down anyway. Make sure that you're getting the information you need. Because as you get done with this process, okay, you're going to wade into the search. And as you wade into the search, everybody stays on their roles. And before you start that search, you're going to go ahead and give another canine warning. What does it hurt? What does it hurt for you to do this? If you think that by not giving a warning, you could sneak up on somebody, no. We, you know, that team moving through there makes enough noise, they're gonna know somebody's coming. You might as well give that warning, put more psychological pressure on them to give up, see if you can generate compliance, and if nothing else, everybody knows you tried. Reissue the warning as you go along. There are a lot of triggers for when those warnings should be given. Um, you know, if you change your environment and things like that. But, you know, I'll issue multiple warnings before that search starts. We get going. Also, before you start, talk to the team and confirm that everybody's body-worn video and radios are working. Also, if you're working, particularly if you're working with an outside agency, what are the compass directions? Which way is north? Once you establish which way is north, everybody has a better chance of being able to give good uh, information to radio about the search progress if, they, if they're needed.
Any known hazards? Again, confirmed. We know that we got this coming up. This guy, you know, had a traffic collision over here, stacked it up. There's broken glass all over the place. The car skidded over this. He ran that way. But then he ran, ran back over the accident scene on the way out. So we're going to have to traverse that broken glass or anything else that might be. Broken glass from a burglary uh, entry, things like that. Okay. Also, go over the dog assaulted procedures beforehand. If that dog's assaulted, make a decision. Who's going to try to apply a taser? Who's going to apply um, uh, pepper spray? You can apply pepper spray on a, on a suspect, and it's not going to affect the dog the same way it does the human being because the, their lacrimal gland, they don't have the lacrimal glands to work the same way we do. And so you can probably give yourself a bit of an advantage that way. But think about what those dog assaulted procedures are going to be. Once everybody's got all that, confirm. Everybody ready to go? All right, roll and you start your search. Now, the search process, again, I say in this, you stay in your roles. Handler, resist the urge to get out of your role and dedicated cover. It's really hard for the dedicated cover officers, if they don't do it often, to, to focus on really being the eyes and ears for that canine officer. The eyes and ears on the, off, on the environment for the canine officers whose eyes and ears are on the dog. This is a really critical role and you gotta find, if you get a chance to pick who's gonna have that role when you start your search, you probably should. Even if it's just somebody, maybe they're not the most high speed, low drag tactical officer there, but there's somebody you know that is there is steady and you have good communication with them. Okay, great. Because last thing you want is to try and tell somebody, hey man, I need you to focus with me or have somebody who's afraid to tell you to grab a hold of you by the collar so they tell you to slow down. You're outrunning your team. You need to have somebody you can trust. And make sure that as you go through the search, you stay within your training tactics. Um, I'm, I'm lucky I worked for it. You know, I worked for an agency that had a uniform process to searching buildings. Uh, I called it MOBS, multiple officer building search. Three officer minimum. We had a, a particular uh, set of algorithms for flow about how we would flow through space and clear them. Everybody in the department knew it. So, you know, if you handle a call, you could do this. That goes out the window when you go to another agency that maybe does a little bit differently. And um, so you got to find out where the train tactics are, where the deviations are as best you can before you start the search. But whatever you do, stay within those train tactics and then move forward thinking of de-escalation the whole time. As you go through this, think about opportunities to de-escalate. So anytime you go to a new environment where maybe that person didn't hear the warning, maybe it's deeper into a building or farther through some very thick woods and brush, stop, give another warning, give that person an opportunity to give up, give that, give that warning so that other people, civilian witnesses can hear you doing it. It will protect you. And again, remember, we're still trying to generate compliance no matter what happens. Give a, de give a stop, get behind something big enough to stop bullets if your dog starts giving you proximity indications. Everybody thinks, oh, we're getting close and we're going to rush in there. No, we're getting close. We've got an opportunity here. That opportunity means stop, get behind something big enough to stop bullets and call that person out and say, look, you got a chance here. And remind them, if, you know, who you are, that that dog's at play, that if that dog finds that the dog could bite them and they got a chance to not have that happen if they just come out or if they just contact the nearest officer. And also, if you hear sounds of movement, pause, listen because you get more intelligence about this, this search process if you hear that movie. You may get a direction of travel that where you can now tell your containment officers, hey, look to your left, look to your right, look east, look west. There's some movement in that direction. Those things are really important for you to consider as you're going through this because that proximity indication um, is it, that, that you have or that sound of movement is one more piece of intelligence that other people need to know about. So make sure that you, whoever is in your search team also is dedicated. I'm the communications officer. I'm the one that's going to do that. Usually that's going to be the commander or he's going to delegate it to one of his, uh, the team leader, or he'll delegate it to one of his officers. But have somebody whose job it is to get on the radio because the last thing you want is everybody keying their mic at the same time and nobody's getting through. And remember, as you go through this process, uh, I we, we used to track, and I think Don Slavik will tell you, in the, in the, in the 70s and 80s when I started, we tracked off lead in the Northwest and it was a dead sprint. Um, we know better now. And we know now that superior tactics uh, are 
are done when they're executed in a slow and deliberate way. Uh, this is like uh, the old Wes Harden thing about how you win a gunfight. And that is take your time quickly. All right. That means you don't have any wasted motion, but you don't rush. Go through this thing with your brain engaged and your head clear as you, as you proceed through this process. Now, uh, that proximity indication that we were talking about should be an automatic cue for you to pause. If that dog gives you a proximity indication, it's not a full-blown report that he's found somebody, but he's starting to sniff around door frames, or you're starting to see the bracket in a building search, or you're on a track and you can see all of a sudden he's shifted from ground to picking his head up and working air currents, that's a good time, again, to go ahead, communicate to your cover officers, hey, dog's giving me something, everybody finds cover, and then you take that opportunity to de-escalate. And remember, de-escalation involves controlling the scene, first and foremost. Why do I say get behind something big enough to stop bullets? Because that's one of the ways that um, you can go ahead and take control of that scene from a position of, of relative safety, greater relative safety than being out in the open behind your dog. Get behind cover and then use time, distance, angles, and shielding to your advantage. Slow things down, make your canine announcement, and um, you know, rinse or repeat on that announcement as often as necessary to go forward. Once you're satisfied that up oh, that person's not coming out or they're, they've moved on and this was just a scent pool, then continue on with the search. And if you're lucky, you'll get to the point where that suspect is located. <clears throat> now, if that suspect is located, first thing you do, if everything stops, communicate with the other officers and again, find cover. Now, Located doesn't mean necessarily bitten. I'm saying that you actually have found him. You have an idea. That person's over there behind that tree or in that bush or I see him up there or my dog is bracketed this and I'm absolutely positive that person is there behind that thing I can't see. Stop, communicate, find cover just like you did before. Stay in your roles, de-escalate to the extent you possibly can. Remember, feasibility is about does it make sense to try to do this now? Can we get this done? Can we de-escalate? It's not feasible if that person is taking aggressive action against you right now or against another person putting somebody at risk. All bets are off at that moment and you're gonna go have to go ahead and take action and possibly apply force. But when it's feasible, attempt to de-escalate. Generate that compliance that you need. And if it's a barricaded suspect, what do you do? Once that person's in a barricade behind walls, it's gonna be played out differently. I'm going to say that in in my old agency, they said that right then and there, patrol officers, canine officers, wash your hands of that search and pass it on to SWAT. That's SWAT's job. They handle barricaded subjects. You don't. We do this. Other agencies are going to say, well, canine, you're a special operations resource. You're going to stay on this. Patrol officers, you're going to stand fast until SWAT gets here. And then eventually, maybe they're going to tell you to send your dog in. Okay, that's great. Do it with all due deliberation. And realize that when you when you do this, you have to make a decision about whether you're going to apply that dog as a tool of force or not. And Scott, you know, I'm going to quote Scott Sargent again on this. He said, this is the critical question, critical question you have to ask yourself. Would the use of the canine be more or less likely to contribute to su 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 successfully controlling the suspect? I, you know, in other words, is that dog biting that person likely to ramp this up? or dial it down. Very often, just realize, when that dog's on the bite, things tend to escalate, things tend to accelerate. Is that what you really want in that moment? You gotta make a decision, because if you can generate compliance without getting that, everybody comes out the better. <clears throat> now, if that suspect is, <clears throat> excuse me, for example, um, you're in an engagement, oops, wait a minute, I'm gonna go back up here. If you're in engagement with the, the suspect and that suspect's getting the upper hand, different story. If that suspect is putting somebody else at risk, different story. How, um, if you have a bunch of officers that are trying to handcuff that guy and they're struggling with him, but he doesn't have the upper hand, probably ought to keep the dog out of it. Canine officers have lost their jobs when they have tried to use the dog as a tool of pain compliance in that circumstance. Not a good idea. It does not look fav upon favorably by this. And you have to realize something, that when we when we talk about this, uh, this use of force analysis, if you make a decision to do this, 
the only body that is enjoined not to use 2020 hindsight. In Graham versus Connor, remember, it talks about uh, these circumstances, these are to be used, uh, not uh, viewed not with 2020 hindsight, um, but by now sort of dealing with the circumstances that are tense and rapidly evolving. Only the courts are thus enjoined. Your department policy is not, your department's Office of Professional Accountability or whatever its equivalent is, your IIS, um, your IA, what do you want, whatever you want to call them, community groups, they don't care. They're going to use 2020 hindsight all day long. They will break video down frame by frame and say, and they'll use what's known as decision point analysis. You had this in front of you there, what did you decide? You had this in front of you there, what did you decide? If the decisions you make tend to accelerate instead of decelerate something, um, they're going to question it and you're going to have to come up with answers. Not saying that the answer is wrong. Sometimes there's a need to do it, but to understand the dog is really not the best pain compliance tool in the world because it's a binary. If I put a gooseneck come along on somebody and I want to get them out from point A to point B and I apply pressure on that wrist and they go up on their toes and they go, okay, I'm going to come with you. Guess what? I can lighten up the pressure on that, still maintain control of that arm and and essentially reinforce their cooperation by taking the discomfort away. Dog can't do that. They don't modulate the same way. It's it's a binary. It's on. It's off. There's a lot of pain, or there's or the dog is off, and um, that's not looked favorably on the courts when you think of it as a pain compliance tool. You have to have really extenuating circumstances to have that make sense. Now, if the dog is on the bite. Again, we, we're talking about the gram factors, and we know that that's the severity of the crime, whether the suspect is resisting or fleeing, and whether they pose a threat to officers or others. And understand that most of the courts, most of the circuits right now, are putting most of the weight on that last one, whether that person poses a threat to officers or others. The severity of the crime by itself does not justify a bite. Even the homicide suspect doesn't necessarily justify a bite if they're not resisting, they're not fleeing, and they aren't posing a threat to others. So understand, this is a, a balancing act between those three things, and they will put different weight on each of them. But the one most critically examined is whether that person throws the, poses a threat to officers or others. Your job is to articulate how that person posed a threat in that moment and understand whether they actually do or not before you decide you're going to apply that dog. Because um, use of force analysis is shifting to consider necessary necessity and proportionality. In other words, was it mandated by policy, law, or both? Did it have to happen? They're looking at this. They're long or saying it was just reasonable the officer did it. No. Did it have to happen? That's what the necessity pieces. And was it proportional? Did the degree of force fit with the level of resistance offered? And you're going to have to consider some things. Is that suspect still a threat? Is they, are they still armed? Uh, are the environment, is the environment, uh, you know, one in which it's clear for you to move up and take control of that person? You know, realizing that a verbal out is preferred, but we also know that sometimes you're going to have to do a hands-on out. And if you do that, you're giving up the tactical advantage of being behind something that's big enough to stop bullets to go up there and move forward with that dog to do it. And so some of the reasons for doing that is maybe because of the, the struggle and, and proximity to other weapons there, you need to have other officers take control of that person's arms and legs before the dog lets go. Don't waste time. Get it over with quickly. The courts are really, really hammering the idea of um, time on bite also. It's not looked on favorably if we leave that dog on there while that person's essentially not giving up, saying, I want to give up now. And even if they don't have their hands clear at that point, they're starting to think you probably ought to think about letting, getting that dog off them. Do it as quickly and efficiently as you can. And that's where practice with your patrol officers is really a good thing because some of them probably are too comfortable moving forward while that dog's on, on them. And so if you can help them de develop that degree of comfort, life gets better when you're actually having to deploy the dog out in the field. Um, and again, stay in your roles. Resist the urge in that moment to take over and be the team leader. I mean, if you have to snap somebody out of it, go ahead and do that. But generally speaking, you're the one that's clear, and you've seen this enough times in training to know what it looks like for a dog to be on bite. They don't. They have never been exposed to it. And for the first time, for some of them, it's a bit of a shock, and they have to think about it. And once you get this all done, now you got to deal with the post-bite stuff. When that post-bite comes up, the first thing that they're going to want to know that you've done is attend to the suspect injuries. 
Then they care that we've confirmed other officers' well-beings. Well-being. It's important for us to think about um, this, and they're all important. I, you know, I want to take care of my team first and foremost. No doubt about that. Unfortunately, we actually have laws that are being instituted in some states, Washington being one of them, in which they put a priority. They say you have to do this. They don't say you have to attend to the team's well-being. So we have to comply with that component of the law. Then make sure you notify something. As soon as our handlers know that as soon as they got a bite, first thing to do, they tell radio, notify a canine supervisor and get that canine supervisor on the way. And then um, you take care of making sure that suspect's injuries are taken care of. Um, you evacuate uh, the suspect from the scene if they need to go for medical treatment. Um, all of those things are done. And you have to make a decision about whether you're going to go ahead and continue the search. Uh, because if you continue the search, are you looking for additional suspect or suspects or is there evidence? Or if you were tied up with the use of force, can you still deploy that dog under the use of force? Your policy will clear it up. Our policy says that, that you're still able to deploy unless the dog had an unjustified and unintended bite. At that point, you're done and you bring in another dog. But if that dog had a, uh, a justified bite, they can continue to search for a second suspect or evidence or whatever. Again, still trying to generate compliance. It's really important that, um, that as you go through this, pre this process, once you've got all that stuff done, you debrief. If you don't have debriefs as a part of your culture in your organization, in your canine unit, you probably ought to consider it. After action reports and debriefs are uh, the bread and butter for the military because you get lessons learned from them. You, you pick up things like that and you document it. It's really important too that this documentation, if your department doesn't have a very tightly scripted, uh, clearly defined uh, dog bite investigation process, you need to get ahead of the curve and get one. I would strongly recommend that that post bite process be handled by your by the canine supervisor that comes in, who does not take over as an incident commander or anything like that. That canine supervisor is another special resource that is there to support the canine handler that was employed as a resource in this ICS model search. It's really important to, to realize that as you go through that post bite investigation, that you get photos of the suspect injuries that the, the most accurate depiction possible. That means clean and unbandaged. So you got to be there at just the right time. So sometimes it's good to have either the handler or another officer there get those photos that moment. Um, our agency prefers that you do those photos with a, um, a single lens reflex digital camera, but every officer has a cell phone. So they'll get some with the cell phone because they can know they can get that before the fire department bandages it up and maybe the canine supervisor doesn't get there in time to get that. So it doesn't hurt to have more photos than you need as long as they are accurate depictions of a clean and unbandaged wound. You want them clean so that you can actually see the degree of damage. It's not about hiding how bloody it is. It's about actually seeing what the wound looks like. Get recorded statements, either on body worn or ICV uh, or a separate audio recorder. Recorded statements, particularly of witnesses, particularly of suspects, are critical. Particularly of suspects, you get their Miranda warnings, you advise them that they're being recorded, and you get their account and get them to give you the information they need. Um, and if you can't get that, uh, and in addition to this, if you can't get that, and in addition to it, you should get written statements from the canine officer, from the cover officers that were part of the search team and, that witnessed the use of force and any other witnesses that were there, civilians or officers, because canine investigations, canine bite investigations come under pretty heavy scrutiny, particularly when they start going up further than that, especially if there's anything out of the ordinary um, with them, just the circumstances of being out of the ordinary, you're, it's gonna get looked at. And that's why you want people's memories of this preserved as soon as possible while they're fresh and, um, in a, in a medium that you can get back and you look at and you can get the information you need. Recordings and then written. Now, after the after you're done with all this process, the search is all there, again, go back to the debrief and debrief your post bite process too. Did that work? Did it work out the way we want it to? Because as you go through this process, um, you're gonna wind up doing a lot of searches if you're a canine handler and over time, it will become second nature. And bad habits can pop in there. 
So it's really important to, to, to realize that if you get in the habit of managing canine searches with ICS principles, it helps you do a lot of things. Yeah, it takes more work at the beginning of the search. You're going to front load your effort like that. You're going to spend a lot of time telling everybody who's doing what and making sure that they stay in those roles. But if you have that and you have a dedicated cover officer with you, you're going to come out of your searches intact. You're going to come out just like that team I described earlier. They had their roles defined and everything worked well. And remember, your goal is to try and generate compliance whenever possible. Everybody loves to have an exciting canine deployment. But really, in the end, our goal is to get people to comply. And so our mantra through this is reasonable, necessary, and proportional. That's where the use of force is. Remember that just because fortune may favor the bold, the courts and the public favor patients. Um, I'm pretty much wrapped up with this. We're going to go ahead and go into a, a, a discussion about this right now. We're just going to be a follow-up presentation on this, on the higher levels of this and managing bigger high-level searches that are more complex. Uh, John Kerwick, uh, Lou Furman, and Scott Sargent are going to present on that. It's going to be an awesome thing next month. Tell everybody to come back for that. Um, and in the meantime, if you need to get a hold of me, now that I'm no longer at a seattle.gov email address, you can reach me at steve at proactivecanine.com. And I'm done. So I'm going to go ahead and um, go back to everybody here, stop presenting, and we can open the discussion, Don, if you're ready. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Very good. Um, appreciate the reference to me in the 1970s. <clears throat> um, but let's go, Gene. Well, good afternoon. It's kind of hard to follow Steve White. I mean, he is a, truly a Renaissance man and definitely is a, as familiar with uh, scent as he is with philosophy. So I hope everybody listened to what he had to say. I'm only going to follow up just briefly. Uh, I echo a lot of what Steve says. The handler should not get involved in the handcuffing if possible. There may be times where he has to because you're in a crawl space of an attic or something of that nature. Get it. The sergeant, however, should not be involved in the handcuffing unless exigent circumstances because I'm seeing a lot of situations where command and control is brought up in litigation and the supervisor is supposed to be doing just that, supervising. Why are they getting into the mix and getting involved in the handcuffing and the, uh, the extraneous struggle when they should be standing back directing resources? So again, if you have sufficient personnel, the sergeants should do their job supervising, not getting involved. Uh, Steve Head was straight on when he said the length of time in the bite is a critical factor to consider. There's case law coming out for a period of time now, and uh, everybody's taking a look as how long is the dog on the bite. The initial apprehension may be fine under Graham versus Connor, but the longer that dog stays in the bite, that can become the excessive part in and of itself. And as uh, we are like to say, just because you can doesn't mean you should. Um, I think Steve has talked about this. We really, I'm very concerned about the, uh, the, the risk of losing police dogs because of this national discussion that's going on. And we've all seen the videos that are out there, you know, from dogs being uh, bad deployments and uh, the dog's not being able to come off the bikes right away. The handler's praising their dog on video, which you all understand. The public and the judges don't. So I think we just need to do a better job and not always have to get the bite if we can get the surrender. And uh, I agree that the new terminology as we go forward, I'm already seeing it in California now in some stipulated judgments between our state attorney general and some police departments that are engaged in these uh, Stipulate judgment with our state attorney general's office are using the words proportionality and necessity. It is becoming part of a uh, law enforcement lexicon, and we need to be careful about that going forward. That's about all I have to say, but the ICS system is so important. I'm handling a lot of protest cases for some jurisdictions out here in California, and in a lot of the after action reports for a lot of departments nationwide, ICS is one of the most talked about uh, parts of those operations. So it is a huge factor in law enforcement. People are going to be asking about it. So well done, Steve. I'm looking forward to next month as well. So thank you, Don. Gene, uh, one question to you, back at you. Uh, can you uh, uh, 
uh, mention uh, the ramifications of the word necessary in your policy? Yeah. Um, I know in California right now, there's a debate going on. When we um, amended the uh, penal code section that deals with use of force, 835A, about two years ago now, uh, the ACL is arguing because the word necessary is now in there that we have a necessary standard. We can't satisfy a necessary standard because it's an unattainable, perfect standard. Uh, I believe it's still reasonable. And so I think 98% of the population agrees because it, our statute quotes directly out of Graham versus Connor. And so I'm always going to argue reasonableness. But once you start getting to necessity, um, they're going to say, no, it wasn't necessary for you to use the dog. It turns out the suspect wasn't armed. It wasn't necessary to shoot him because he was armed with a bar of soap. That bar of soap uh, could not have harmed you. So therefore, it wasn't necessary nor proportional to have used deadly force on that person. Whereas under the reasonable standard, you had every reason to believe that bar of soap looked like a gun. The suspect acted as if he had a gun, and he, you believed reasonably that your life and the lives of others nearby were, was an imminent danger of death or great bodily injury. So I'm scared we're going to lose that reasonableness argument, and it's going to go to necessity and proportionality, which is going to be a higher standard than Graham. And we're seeing that being pushed throughout the country in Maryland, New Jersey, elsewhere. So uh, don't, help the, don't help our state legislators get there by not using the dogs properly. Thanks, Gene, I appreciate it. I have one more question for uh, Steve or John or Gene or Dave or Lou. Um, what is the, um, what are the possible consequences of uh, using officer safety always instead of giving a warning? Is there any, anybody? I'm a huge proponent in warnings. In all the cases that I've tried, both on the canine side and on the SWAT side, uh, giving warnings, it can't hurt you. It can only help you. And then those become our witnesses saying, my God, that the police department gave warnings for like 20 minutes. I couldn't sleep. Well, that's witness number one I want out there. We're not stealth ninjas. Uh, we've got to give warnings in order to comply with the Fourth Amendment. Again, there's cases all over the country talking about that. Uh, this, isn't, uh, this isn't rocket science. Well, I'm, I, will save you. I'm actually referring, and, and that was great. I, I like the answer. I was actually referring to a po portion of Steve's lecture where he talked about the dog giving some type of a indication absent an actual full out, yeah, he's over there. Um, is that the time that you pick a place of cover and give an announcement is what I was, I was thinking yeah. of? I'm going to chime in and say, yeah, um, that's exactly what I intended. Uh, that as you, as you as you move through the search environment, there will be different environmental cues that should trigger um, further canine announcements. One is going to a place where somebody probably couldn't hear it. Another one's going to be a proximity indication. Another one's going to be where the dog maybe is working something a little harder. That might be time for you to pause. If nothing else, you pause and you try and assess why the dog is giving you that information. And as long as you pause, what does it hurt to give a warning? What, I mean, they ask yourself, what do I lose? Maybe 30 seconds. And if you've got good containment, that 30 seconds works in your favor. Thank you. Uh, John or Lou? Hi, everybody. Uh, John Kerwick here. Steve, thanks for a great presentation as always. And I just uh, I just wanted to uh, highlight one of the things you already covered, but I think it's important enough to do it. You know, we're addressing uh, everybody across the nation with this webinar. So our levels of training are, are specialized units in canine and for patrol are varied beyond belief. Some have some excellent training and some can form up a, a search team right away and some have no clue what you're talking about when you get there. And I've experienced both sides of that. Um, that's why I just want to just reinforce the containment part. Um, I was one of those old guys, too, who was trained originally to just get your dog out of the car and start on the track. And those three, they're gone. And I, I really hope that uh, people aren't alluding to that anymore during their training. But the only way that we can actually act properly when we first get to a scene with that dog 
is to have containment. There, when we get there, we got to admit it. it's so important. Otherwise, we're going to have to wait for our guards. We're going to have to wait for our our wing people and some of our cover officers to set up and have these debriefings before before we go out there. Um, if we don't do that today, bad things are going to happen to us, and and it's going to end up in a result of uh, uh, a bad bad day. I'll just leave it there. Um, the now is just slow everything down and just do what we're supposed to do it's so important and steve you covered it but i just felt it was worth mentioning that uh it, it's hard to untrain sometimes and uh, we were actually trained to when we got to a scene to get out of the car with your canine on lead to walk up and get and get the information and i don't know whether i would be the person uh to say that it's a good idea these days i think things got to down during the scene and then initialize it and do it properly. Containment is everything. Thanks. Go ahead, Lou. All right. Thank you very much. So I wrote a few notes here. I kind of like to underscore a couple things. And I come from this at a different perspective. I'm, I'm here in New Hampshire and I see Alex is here too. Uh, so listen, um, you know, we share our resources quite a bit up here and there's many, many instances where dogs are deployed into other jurisdictions uh, to help out a neighboring agency. So I want to kind of cover those points and underscore some of the things that Steve talked about that pertain to that. And But I want to start by saying that, you know, it just doesn't, what he talks about isn't just for person searches. You know, this can be for the explosive detection dog going into another jurisdiction. This can be for a search and rescue type operation. This, a, a lot of what he covered uh, in his powerful program, uh, covers not just the felonious type of search, but all kinds of searches where you might be uh, deploying your dog um, in an incident command type of situation. So, um, you know, I, I, the most important thing is I want to underscore the importance of the cover officers that you're going with. You know, and I often tell this story of how I was once called to a neighboring agency to go search for a dangerous person. And my cover officer, uh, upon starting, took out his pipe and started smoking a pipe like we were going out for an English fox hunt. And, um, okay, so that, that's a problem, no doubt. So, you know, covering the, uh, the cover officer, the importance of that, I wanted to underscore and start with that. But other things that come in with other jurisdictions is their level of training. Uh, you know, do they have similar tactics? Um, you know, what's going to be their reaction upon, you know, you coming across somebody? It may be their very first felonious type of arrest with some of these smaller agencies. Um, so, you know, you have various levels of training, various levels of experience. You have different policy considerations too. They may be operating under different policy than you. Um, I always like to bring my own cover offices from my agency, just so I knew that I had one or two uh, similar backup offices to what I was going to do. And hopefully, those backup officers that I was bringing from my agency were also experienced with working with me and the dog at the same time. So we had that kind of a, you know, a, a first response team going into the area. But then you had the familiarity with the area, you know, you, I, so I, I can't remember how many times I was in the woods and I had really no idea where the heck I was going. We come across the street. I don't know what street I was on um, and trying to give directions like that. But I want to talk administratively, too, about what gets included in the other officers' reports from other agencies. Now, they may not be trained to, um, you know, to just include in their report that the dog was deployed and then leave to you to talk about the dog's uh, actions and behavioral changes and things like that. So you may get a, an officer in another jurisdiction that is uh, really freelancing uh, your dog's actions, that the dog was not even on scent at certain times and, and just uh, kind of narrating uh, their uh, amateur, amateur approach towards you working the dog. Uh, so you need to make sure um, what gets included in their report is not going to be conflictory with uh, your professional analysis of what, how the dog was reacting in there. Other things you got to worry about is who's collecting evidence along the way. Uh, what do we do with that footprint that you're finding that might be very valuable? Who's going to be picking up that gun or whatever? Um, and what happens to those type of things? 
And then lastly, I'm going to leave with this. And this is the internal report or the internal investigation that occurs from your deployment of the dog that another agency is doing. And that is why Steve mentioning the debrief is so very important because you have to have a debrief of your call where you are deploying your dog in another jurisdiction. And guys, it is so that you can write down in your notebook the, uh, the, the comments that the other officers have made immediately upon your call. Because don't be surprised if when the crap hits the fan and two weeks later, all kinds of attention is placed upon this call and now all those other officers, hmm, they have a different recollection of what they have that night. And they're now throwing you under the bus for your action. And that's why it's important that when you have your debrief, you kind of write down a couple of the notes and say, Officer X said, yeah, you know, thank God your dog was there. It was very important that your dog was deployed that way or something like that so that they can't later change their words because the heat is now on them. So you need to make sure that you're protecting yourself. You need to make sure that you are uh, writing an accurate report as to uh, what happened and how the dog was reacting. And um, most importantly, um, I think that we need to pay attention that the canine handler is not the incident commander, but actually is a tool that is being used at that incident. So that's all I have, Don. Thank you very much, Steve. That was a powerful presentation. Uh, and thank you for everybody else for being here. Steve, I got the impression, and it was well given, that um, we no longer need to be the tip of the spear. Um, we need to be using our dogs as a locating tool with the possibility of having to do something such as that. Um, but now we have uh, cover officers and things like that to help us out, and I appreciate everything you said. As Steve has alluded to, we, this is from the ground up. So we are starting this series as a ground up next uh, in December. We will have this, the next part of this video. We will alert you the same way uh, with uh, all kinds of emails and postings and things like that. Um, I appreciate the work that the canine group, as I call them, are are doing and I appreciate the fact that all of you uh, chose to come and listen. All of these are on our YouTube website, United States Police Canine Association on YouTube. And we are starting to offer some additional, uh, we, are, we have our first uh, small short video, 10 minutes up there also now on techniques for a canine searching a car. But I appreciate everything. Um, and if you have any questions, USPCA uh, executive director at gmail.com. Thank you, everybody. Have a good day. Be safe.